This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guests today are Courtney Balaker and Ted Balaker, the team behind the new documentary, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's based on the 2018 best-selling book by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, and the film follows a series of students as they navigate life on today's highly charged college campuses. I talk with Courtney and Ted, who started his video career as one of the first hires at Reason TV, about the Gen Z mental health crisis, free speech, DEI, the oppressor victim worldview, and why they chose to host their film on the innovative platform Substack rather than a more traditional venue. Here is The Reason Interview with Courtney Balaker and Ted Balaker. Courtney and Ted Balaker, thanks for talking to Reason. Our pleasure. Thanks for At least us. it's my pleasure. I can't speak for you. It's so the, the movie is The Coddling of the American Mind. It's based on the 2018 book by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff. What is the documentary about and what are you hoping to achieve with it? Uh, well, our little log line is an anxious generation searches for happiness. And that's, that's, it's really a story about happiness. People who lose it and then find it the second time and they value it more the second time. So we follow a global group of 20-somethings who have uh, fallen victim to uh, you know, bad thought patterns, really. Yeah. <laughs> Made themselves miserable and come out the other end. So we hope to reach uh, young people and their parents. Mental health <laughs> among Gen Z is a travesty. Most of the adults were worried I would be in hospitals forever and not really be a functioning human. Almost every other person I know has some sort of mental health problem. I was scared of what the day was gonna bring me. It just kind of radiates outward and outward until everything around you is destroyed. How did you go about picking the particular students? There's uh, Lucy who's American and is neurodivergent and had been hospitalized before she uh, showed up at Stanford. A man named Saeed who's Nigerian and ends up at Lafayette in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania. Kimmy, uh, uh, African-American girl from, at the Art Institute of California, Arian, and I may be mispronouncing his name, an Indian student who goes to college in Michigan. A woman named Anna, who is at Providence College. Like, What went into this kind of crew of people who have trouble adjusting to college? We wanted the fewest amount of students to tell the most important parts of the mm -hmm. book. And so we focus on the three great untruths, uh, which we shorten in the film to number one, you are fragile, number two, always trust your feelings, and number three, us versus them, so mm -hmm. that you know the world is a struggle between good and evil. So each one of these uh, subjects uh, kind of embodies at least part of that story. Um, and so we, the way we found them was uh, a mixture of serendipity and, and hard work. In some cases, um, like Lucy just wrote an article for, for Quillette that we found. Uh, the other ones, it was just very circuitous. Um, can we, let's talk about Lucy a little bit, because she had been hospitalized for what, what, before she goes to Stanford. Yeah, she was literally in a locked yeah. psych ward mere months before <laughs> starting at Stanford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they didn't uh, really know what was going on until she was finally diagnosed with autism, and it, it took a while. And, mm -hmm. um, and she didn't like that diagnosis. She was actually really angry about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see in the film, um, and this really fascinated us getting to know her, um, when she kind of shifted into activism, when she mm -hmm. got to Stanford, she perceived the phrase, people with autism, as equal to somebody saying autistic people should be killed. Right. They shouldn't be here. I became convinced that if someone used the phrase person with autism, my brain would immediately go to, they think that autism can be separated from the person. Well, that means that they want autism to be separated from the person, which means that they want autism to be cured, which means that they want people with autism not to exist. And that is eugenics, which amounts to genocide. So just three words, person with autism, and I would immediately be thinking about genocide. She basically took her diagnosis as something that was horrible to other mm. people, people that, that would not accept it. Mm. And that really surprised us, because autism has uh, been diagnosed for a very long time. People mm. have known about it for a very long time, and we've never really met anyone who associated that phrase 
a person with autism, meaning you are not normal, you are yeah. not okay, and you shouldn't be here, and she associated with genocide, which was right. fascinating to us. And that, how does that exemplify kind of the Stanford that she showed up at? was kind of like, yeah, okay, we can run with that, right? They weren't like, no. I mean, obviously on a basic level, they're welcoming to her. They're like, come and, you know, you can study, you can go to college here. But talk a bit about how that kind of us versus them or that kind of kind of uh, catastrophizing thought pattern was at work where she shows up. I think Lucy was, was really great on this disability as an us versus them, finding your people. So we are all disabled, therefore no one else can relate to us, no one else can uh, associate with us, mm -hmm. and we're better. And she even talks about in the film, right? Um, I think what she realized is that that's not a very healthy way to identify yourself. Mm -hmm. It's just, if you have a disability, you can matriculate, you can mm -hmm. go into society and, and live a normal life and a happy life. But she got kind of sucked into this disability group mm -hmm. and mentality and activism that made her really unhappy. And when But she it came also out of it, was her identity. For a while oh, yeah. it was, absolutely. Yeah. What's, and, what snapped her out of that? Uh, it was a long process. Um, she, I think uh, COVID actually helped, if you can believe it, because she was off campus for a while. Mm -hmm. And so she could kind of collect her thoughts. She also had, and we see this in a lot of the students that we've spoken to, had a uh, a friend who she could count on, who even though Lucy was kind of going down this dark spiral, was still there for her. And so her friend at a very critical time said, why don't you try reading this? And she sent her like links mm -hmm. to people. And through that, she learned about um, like Glenn Lowry, John McWhorter. Mm -hmm. And she said that there was this whole new world that she didn't realize mm -hmm. existed. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of dove into that. And, and one of the things that she discovered was uh, Greg and John's book. Huh. Yeah. So um, uh, one of the other students, Kimmy, who I mentioned, who went to the Art Institute of California, um, she's African-American. She um, came out of a religious background. Um, and she uh, talked about how um, the 2016 shooting of Philando Castile, which is you know horrifying to watch and whatnot, that really kind of helped to activate her sense that, you know, that the election of Donald Trump, she had talked about being very pro Hillary Clinton, that she kind of became obsessed with white supremacy and mm -hmm. would spend long hours on Twitter trying to find statements which she could then report to the Twitter police. I tried to do whatever I could to curb the existence of white supremacy and like the roots of, of white supremacy, which to me seemed to be coming from certain Twitter accounts, uh, such as Ben Shapiro, Ann Coulter, and this guy, Mark Dice, or whatever. And I was like, why are they, why are they on Twitter? Like, how have they not been banned yet? And I thought that was just, just a function of no one's actually taking the initiative to report them. How did she work through that to get to a better place? Because her transformation is one of the most compelling, I think. Yeah, she went into a, a very dark spot and, yeah, was obsessed, like you said, with, with finding, um, uh, you know, any, any hint of racism on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, one thing that really fascinated Courtney and me about Kimmy is that she had not read the book or even heard about it. Mm -hmm. But she ended up doing a lot of the things Greg and John recommend because of her, uh, her background. She's a Christian. And so she said at one point, um, I, can't, I can't be, as a Christian, I can't be offended. I have to learn how to love people who, um, hmm. who, who hate me even, who disagree with me. And then so through that taking stock, she's like, hmm. Um, and she has some funny lines like, you know, maybe that one incident wasn't actually racism. Maybe it was just indigestion, like someone was. Yeah. Um, and she was taught um, to, 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 to interpret any kind of interaction with someone who wasn't um, a black female as almost always hostile. And that's just a very miserable way to go through life. Yeah. And she had the moment where she talks about going to a skate park with a friend yes. and they come back with totally, she's yeah. like, well, this was like a great, happy experience. And her friend was like, I was scared all the time. Yeah. How did that, like, how did she come to recognize that she had 
her perception was more important to her than her friends. It's a great example of cognitive distortion. Mm -hmm. When you walk into a situation and you think something is happening or people are thinking other things that you don't know because you can't read their minds, it makes you really scared or unhappy. But that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. And what she experienced in that moment when they left the park, her friend was like, no, I felt like we were in danger. I felt like we were being judged. And she said, no, I had a good time. We're just skating with pros and hanging out. That's when Kimmy said, you and I had a very different experience and we shared the same experience, right. but you saw it one way and I saw it completely differently. And I'm walking away happy and fulfilled and you're walking away upset and angry. And I think for her, that was just in practice, the cognitive distortion that your perception of something isn't always true and it's not always that person's perception or that person's perception. So she's an incredibly smart person. She's very interested in evolving and, mm -hmm. and, and growing, and as we all should be. And that was a great moment for her to just say, no, you're not right about me and what I experienced, and I'm not right about what you experienced. Uh, a third student who I want to uh, talk about is Arian or Arian, yeah. Arian, excuse mm -hmm. me, um, who's Indian and got a scholarship to go to school at Michigan or in Michigan, right? Right. Yeah. And um, he, what's a little bit different is that he comes in and among the many, he he has like four or five jobs that he's doing because he needs <laughs> yeah. spending money, and then he has to say, uh, take a DEI training for one of them. And he immediately realizes that this is just like insane. We were made to play a game. This website had a game where a statement popped up and all of us had to choose one of the op option A, B, and C, D. A was sexist, B was ageist, C was transphobic, and D was racist. And we had to choose which of these forms of bigotry was that statement. That statement was a statement in vacuum, bereft of any context, and it was gamified. This was all based in some pseudo-scientific nonsense, which has no basis in any psychology or any therapy. After all, the meeting was being conducted by a gender studies professor, not a psychologist. Why was he different, like he, uh, uh, other than the other students? He seemed to come in and be like, okay, there's something wrong here. Yeah, the why he was different is very interesting. It's, it's something we unfortunately don't get to, to get into too much, but he did, uh, he comes from India, as you mentioned, and he has a, a background in debate, in high school debate. And so he, and he was a very accomplished debater. And so he had been taught to think for, for himself and to think logically. And not only that, but to, in, as you probably know, in, in formal debate, a lot of times, at least in high school, the kids have to argue things for things that they don't actually agree right, with. Right, right. So he uh, came to college, I think, a lot more intellectually equipped than a lot of his colleagues. Um, and so he saw through a lot of this, a lot of these bad ideas that were foisted on him and others mm -hmm. through the administration. And he just, uh, he's a very courageous kid. And yeah. And he stuck his neck out and got sort of got lopped off, but uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it it all ended it all ended pretty well for him. I wanted to uh, kind of get back to one of your uh, prior questions about how we chose the the students. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that fascinated us when we were vetting the students, I mean, John and Greg's voices are incredibly yeah. important in the film, but m even more importantly, that they would agree with is the students, this generation speaking and and talking about being on a modern day college campus. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating to us to have international students talk about coming from other mm -hmm. countries with this vision that they had about the American university yeah. experience. Uh, Uganda, Nigeria, yeah. India, they had this vision with, from Dead Poet Society, watching yeah. American movies, Robin yeah. Williams on a desk, being inspiring, <laughs> debating. Thank you and about they, higher education. <laughs> you know, most of the movies about higher ed are oh, like, yeah. don't go there. Yeah. It's like you're going to get murdered. Are yeah. attractive. Yeah, yeah. They're usually single. Their wife yeah. died. They have a great suit. Right. They're inspiring. And then they come out here, a, a lot of them during the election, and they're like, mm. what's going on? This yeah. is like a war zone in terms of pick your side. What's your activism? Mm -hmm. uh, pick your people. And that's just not 
what they envisioned, uh, where they grew up, and they were really shocked and uh, a little scared by it. One of the, you know, one of the things that I found really um, powerful in it is, in a way, what the the people you talk about show is. I mean, this is the point of college of, you know, that you go there and you don't know who you are, mm-hmm. and then you change and you you get a better sense of yourself. I guess many of them showed up knowing who they were, and I'm a social justice warrior, I'm this or I'm that, and they get disabused of that. So in a way, it's almost like, okay, this is just kind of being a young adult, right? Yeah, um, and we have, uh, our different subjects have different kind of experiences with that. Some of them um, didn't start out like as social justice activists, Mm -hmm. and had a very different, even someone like Lucy, you would, on the one hand, you think just a couple months removed from a locked psych ward, yeah. you know, she might have had some big psychological issues, but she was really on the right path and things were looking up for her. Mm-hmm. So she was entered not at all as with this social justice mindset, but it took only mere months for her to see that everything around her was being framed as good versus evil, us versus them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, we're all kind of eager to put ourselves on, on the right side of that matrix, like on the, on the, good, the good people. The, uh, and, and she figured that she could do that um, by kind of heralding and focusing on her, her autism. That would make her different. People would yeah. listen to her more, as she tells us in the movie. And that was, I mean, it was the right strategy in the moment, right? Sure. She oh, gets yeah. more, I don't want to use the word clout, but she gets more clout it's by a, exactly saying, clout. I can yeah. speak this way. Yeah, she said people just started not, like once, yeah. she, even once she used their jargon, um, hegemonic, blah, 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 you know, mm-hmm. this and that, um, all the jargon that, that's so familiar to us now, one she of, said people just smile at her more. One of the things I think uh, anybody, uh, you know, in the coddling of the American mind was, you know, uh, it's, you know, like the exorcist for nonfiction books in the late <laughs> teens, right? It's, it's like probably that, still yeah. <laughs> on the, uh, on you know, on the bestseller list. But anybody who's seen the movie or read the book, this is informed by it. And Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff help provide a kind of intellectual frame. But What's most fascinating is the voices of the students and the kind of sense of what's happening on campuses. Do you think, are we past kind of peak woke? Um, or, you know, and one of the things you guys are doing this massive college campus tour, mm-hmm. what are you finding on campus? Like how, how is the movie being, uh, you know, responded to? How is it being received? Uh, things like that. Yeah, it, 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 there's sort of uh, two different worlds. There's the entertainment industry, and are they getting past woke? And then yeah. is the real world getting past woke? And I think that there are two different answers. I So far, when we screen at university, students are very receptive. In fact, one student uh, at Harvard was like, I think this might have been a fad. This might be passing. We're like, we hope so. Yeah. You know, but right. um, most of the students are, are very receptive and, and compelled by it. Um, Hollywood, the entertainment industry, I don't know. I mean, I try to be hopeful. I try to think that uh, great art has no boundaries and that we shouldn't be constrained by um, studio executives who are afraid, Mm -hmm. not by ideas, but of getting fired and canceled. And I think that's still really strong Mm. in in the entertainment industry. So I I, I don't know how far we are beyond woke. Yeah, in and media and entertainment. I know. Um, we'll talk about your Substack where you premiered the movie or debuted it, et cetera, in just a second. But I know you were at Cornell, and yeah. people had ripped down posters of the movie. Is that, you know, should we read a lot into that, or what? What's your sense of? Yeah, that? I mean, they ripped down posters, uh, and there was also um, our our host there, a professor named Randy Wayne. He he uh, does a lot of work to try to get more people involved in in free speech there. It's supposedly the, the year of free expression at Cornell, but right. the way he tells it is yeah, that and just yeah, recently whole lot, uh, whole an assistant professor got arrested for um, disrupting an Ann Coulter talk, like, right. literally <laughs> right. a day or so ago. So, right. so, yeah. so it, things free are looking up. Yeah. That is know, more we, free expression. Well, although when we music. logged onto the campus <laughs> Wi-Fi, it, it said yeah. like there was a picture of a Sunday, like 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 ice cream, and we learned that Sundays were like invented there in Ithaca or something. Uh-huh. And it said the year of free expression. We're like, Randy, what does an ice cream Sunday have to do with free expression? He's like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But so do you, I mean, what, uh, you know, so have you faced much hostility on campuses yet or? Uh, not so much from the students, more from the, the administrators. And um, like there were a number of them, 20 so, who were going to attend at Cornell. And RSVP had said that they were looking forward to it. And not one of them showed up. Hmm. And we don't know, of course, why that is. And these were people in uh, like uh, in administrative positions dealing with counseling. So it's like exactly right. the kind of people we, we want to connect with. And uh, Randy suspects something fishy if not not a one of them showed up. Yeah. Um, and frankly, most of the hostile questions come from professors, not not from the students. That's interesting. And that's kind of a reversal of the coddling book, because the starting point of that is that is the uh, belief that students were now asking for restrictions rather yeah. than faculty. So maybe that, you know, turn of the wheel is happening back. We hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk about the distribution uh, strategy. You have a sub stack that's called the coddling of the American mind is the, uh, the coddling movie dot com yeah. coddling movie dot com. Um, and it's a fantastic, robust thing that you, you can see the movie there. Um, how was it? This is the first narrative length documentary or I guess movie that's been debuted that premiered on Substack. How is that as a kind of alternative distribution mechanism? Yeah, so far it's been great. I mean, it, um, we went to Chris and Hamish, the uh, co-founders of Substack and said, you guys have liberated writers. Now it's time to liberate filmmakers. And they really responded to that. They, they really connected with the movie. And so we're really proud to be the very first Substack Presents feature film. And we think uh, we want to be the first of many. You know, we would plan to have more of our films start there, too. And we've actually already been contacted by some, some prominent filmmakers who, who have also been um, victimized by what we call the chilling effect, or the, the great chill, I should say. Um, it's not so much the cancel culture explosions that we hear with Dave Chappelle, it's what happens kind of like below the waterline. Um, uh, you know, there's the tip of the iceberg and then the, the real action happens yeah. below the waterline. And so. you wrote at your affiliated subsec, which is called Shiny Herd, about a filmmaker that you called Jane, oh, yeah. who's having trouble getting out there and you muse whether or not she might use an alternative method. Is that, I mean, what do you think, uh, you know, Courtney, you worked in more kind of conventional Hollywood stuff um, will people do that or are people as much as they might think, you know, Hollywood, whatever that means, but mm -hmm. you know, the kind of legacy institutions, it carries so much status, so much more money, so much more, you know, distribution possibilities. Well, people like, you know, this isn't serving me, but I don't want to go an independent route. It's, it's the wild west really. Mm -hmm. It changes constantly. I mean, what, was true 10 years ago is different now. And that's why we did what we did yeah. with Substack, for instance. Uh, we had a, a very uh, highly reputed big distributor for documentaries that wanted to distribute, and they're great. But we're, we just realized that the marketplace, especially for documentaries, independent documentaries, un unless it's sex, death, and murder, which yeah. is easier, and that's what the streamers make. They right. create their own content, right? They don't need us to make that stuff. Um, but if it's something a little bit more different or outside the, the norm, you do have to do weird and different things. And I think to answer your question, yeah, I, mm. distribution is constantly changing. It's really difficult. It can be very expensive. Um, being in theaters is very expensive. So yeah. it doesn't make sense for a lot of mm -hmm. independent documentaries. It doesn't make sense for a lot of narrative films. And, right. and we're going to be on uh, a lot of the more familiar streamers yeah. uh, fairly soon. But uh, the, the Substack experience will be great for that too because we'll start with, when we go switch to those guys, we'll have these many thousands of email addresses mm -hmm. from fans of the film who are like very passionate about the film. And we hope if we ask nicely, they'll help like yeah. spread the word. I loved in that uh, piece about uh, Jane, I think you said something along the lines of like, Hollywood loves a controversial movie, but not a problematic one. <laughs> right, so that's like if it's, <laughs> it's, you know, if you can jump on a gravy train, yeah, let's do it. But yeah. if it's actually difficult, then, you know, what, we're exactly. not interested. Yeah. Is there uh, the previous, uh, among the previous productions that you've done as Corchula Productions, uh, first off, where is that name from? 
Uh, it's it's uh, it's an island in Croatia. Okay. That Ted so, visited when he was young. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just quite a whimsical personal reasons. For okay, for <laughs> um, but uh, among the things that you've done were. Um, uh, the uh, dramatic movie Little Pink House about the uh, Kilo uh, decision about eminent domain abuse. And then you also did Can We Take a Joke, which is a documentary about how cancel culture or you know uh, speech restrictions were kind of hurting comedy. Is there a through line to everything that you guys do? Well, we always wanted to be uh, Liberty's participant media. So we were um, big fans of participant media. That's uh, the big outfit um, funded by eBay billionaire Jeff Skoll. Mm -hmm. So we do things on a much smaller budget. And participant media tends to, they when they do, they support something or help produce and release it, and then there's usually some kind of social campaign exactly. that goes around it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we do impact campaigns with all of our films. So we treat those as separate projects. I mean, we're in the midst of one right now. It's, it's a lot of work. In some ways, it's more work than than the film itself. But so, yeah, I mean, whether it's Can We Take a Joke, that was free speech, um, Little Pink House, you could say it's about eminent domain abuse, but it's really more fundamental than that, I'd say. It's about force and like when is force, is, when is force okay and when, it, when is it not okay. It's also about cronyism. Um, and of course, um, the coddling has a lot of free speech elements in it as well. Um, so we, um, we it, certainly, I would say that that kind of classical liberalism is is the through line. Mm -hmm. Do you think our you know our people maybe not in Hollywood, but are you know are people sick of you know kind of being told not to say things, not to think things, not to you know be the way they are? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that um, creative people like to have freedom and no boundaries to tell the stories in the way they want to and. Mm -hmm. Right now, and certainly it ha as it's been in the past five years, uh, there isn't that freedom. There's a lot of fear mm -hmm. going on with uh, filmmakers, writers, studio execs, distributors. And the fear isn't coming from their own personal fear. It's coming from fear from outside, how mm -hmm. they will be perceived. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get canceled. I don't want to cast a person of color as the villain in a film, mm -hmm. which is so literally a mandate. the Jesus Christ Superstar remake, it's on... Judas is not going to be a black guy. Right? <laughs> right. No, I mean, that was a breakthrough at the moment, right? It's like, finally, I got a leading role. What, one well, of our, yeah, that would be a great yeah. role for lots of One, yeah, yeah. one of our closest friends was formerly um, a casting executive at Paramount Studios, and she said that it was actually a mandate. that Because right. you start with lists, right? Mm -hmm. Actor lists. You do not put a person of color on the bad guy list or the villain list. Yeah. You just don't. So and, in the name of diversity, you deny... Uh, black and brown people roles. Yeah. And those are the best roles, usually. I, they yeah. love to play the villain. They love right. to play the bad guy. Yeah. Uh, but no, but we don't want to, we white executives don't want to be perceived as thinking that people of color are bad. Yeah. It's like, this is ridiculous. So you're taking away art, you're taking away uh, professional experiences and opportunities mm -hmm. because you're afraid yeah. of how you're going to be perceived. That's not good. Um, that's really bad still, but I think people are getting sick of it. Mm -hmm. We know this not just from our own opinions. We've been talking to a lot of people in the entertainment industry secretly, yeah, yeah confidentially, have, and they that, talk that's about a, it. A separate uh, effort that we're doing is to bring, uh, do something to to bring a culture of free speech back to the mm -hmm. entertainment industry. Uh, you both worked at various points for ABC News. Courtney, you have a background in theater. Is theater going through a similar kind of disruption and possible rebirth, or is it, all, you know, is it stuck in the olden days? That's a great question. I, I haven't um, worked in theater professionally for a really long time, so I don't feel like I have my finger on that pulse anymore. Um, you know, look, I mean, so, some of the most um, uh, controversial. Uh, groundbreaking work came from playwrights and theater mm -hmm. and, and shook it up and I hope it I, I hope it still can um, I haven't lived here in New York for a while I used to direct theater here mm -hmm. in New York now I, I live in Southern California theater is, is not a big scene in La mm -hmm. LA still um, I don't know that it's, it's a great question I, I know more about the moving picture format mm -hmm. and kind of what's going on uh, culturally there and politically there 
Um, but I hope theater has that freedom. I mean, I used to do off-Broadway where you had weirdos writing plays, mimes doing, you know, mime shows. And, and it was cool. And you got to just see people experiment and do and things you, that you, were... That's, but you hate mimes. I don't hate mimes. I just had a bad experience with a mime. But we, you all, could, we all have bad experiences with thank mimes. Thank you. Okay. See? Just it's don't want not, you to like portray not, yourself as pro mime. I'm not pro mime. I'm well, just you know, questionable about yeah, mimes. Let's, okay, sorry. Mimes, you know, mimes have rights too, right? <laughs> uh, Ted, you of course in uh, you worked at ABC News. You worked with John Stossel there, but then uh, you were either employee number one or two. It's kind of like it could be either one at Reason TV when we started doing online video back in 2007. Can you talk a bit about how, you know, so, I mean, you're part of an alternative media landscape that has been growing, you know, for the entire entirety of your career. How, you know, what does that kind of, uh, you know, background bring, what do you, what do you, how does that help you bring something different to the table? Yeah, I think you just have to be more resourceful. You can never just be the thing that you're supposed to be. Like, you can't, we're filmmakers, but we can't just be filmmakers. We're, we're sort of entrepreneurs first. We're event planners a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to make something, uh, I think a lot of artists have the idea that, oh, I'm just going to make something so beautiful and so brilliant that people are going to have to show it to others. And uh, maybe I thought of that way for a little while, but you, reality smacks you in the face pretty quickly. And you, have, you realize that you have to care about much more than just writing the script, much more than just directing the movie. You have to think, well, once I, how am I going to ch choose? Do, if I choose this one, will it be distributed? Who will distribute it? Hmm. Um, how will we get this to, uh, to viewers? Um, we teach other independent filmmakers. Um, we have uh, workshops and seminars, and, and our motto is don't just make a movie, make an impact. And we hmm. see a lot of people just thinking only to the movie part. And then it's like, it's done, so I'm done, I'm out. It's like, all right, maybe you made a great movie, but probably no one will see it. Um, you were uh, one of the first people to work on what we called the uh, uh, Drew Carey project at Reason, because it was really from Drew Carey's ideas that we started doing online video. Do you have a, you know, a particular uh, memory of working with Drew that uh, you know, stays with you like a, hot belt across a bare backside <laughs> or something. Well, he said to me, uh, never drop, you should never drop names. De Niro told me that. And then I get to say, well, actually, Drew Carey told me that. So it's yeah. sort of like a meta thing. All right, so, yeah. Um, and you know, but, the one thing is a mime can never do that job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See? But yeah, he came to us and he said, what did he say? He's like, I love Reason. You guys have uh, lots of uh, uh, steak, but you need more sizzle. Right. And um, and now, ironically, he eats a lot of steak and is skinnier. <laughs> He's, He's so like, skinny. Right, yeah. well, so yeah. he was, he, lots of foresight there. <laughs> do you so, think that's true? I mean, do you think the video, because you also worked as a print journalist or as a policy yeah. analyst, do you think, you know, does film or moving pictures have more, ultimately have more of an impact than writing? Uh, I, that's a good, good question. I mean, you could... Um, I think storytelling does. I mean, you even take someone you know as controversial as Ayn Rand. Like her, her big books aren't on metaphysics. It's Atlas Shrugged. Or it, mm -hmm. um, it's um, the Fountainhead. You know, tell a good story. And I think um, I think these days people are far more likely to watch moving pictures than to read anything. And that, frankly, that's one of the reasons we wanted to do the Coddling movie because it's it's sort of a trailer for the book. And we had like a young woman, Mia, at Georgia State, who loved the film. And she's like, now I want to go read the book. And that was so heartwarming to us because most people don't read stuff that comes out of the Atlantic. Or mm -hmm. even if it's a bestseller, they don't read heady nonfiction books. It's just a teeny tiny portion of the world who does. When you can put a human face on a topic or an issue or an idea, I think it's far more compelling uh, to an audience and people can ingest the ideas and the message uh, as opposed to just talking about a topic or an idea or a message. And I think this is true and true. Again, uh, the Suzette Kilo case, you know, it's about eminent domain, but not really, as Ted said, uh, it's really about force, but it's really about a human being that worked all her life for this piece of property mm -hmm. 
to relax and enjoy this next chapter of her life, and then someone said, no, you don't get to do that. Mm -hmm. And that can happen to anybody. But you have to tell it in a way that lets people identify as a human being, as a person. You could very well go through it, or already has. Uh, final uh, note, uh, tell us exactly where to go on Substack <laughs> so that we can watch the movie <laughs> and participate in the community yes. that you're building around the coddling of the American mind yeah. movie yeah. documentary. Yeah, uh, go to the coddling of the coddling movie.com. Jeez, I almost got it wrong. The coddling movie.com, and there you can watch it. You can subscribe. So you, that means you get to watch the movie and come along for our, our tours and other things. You can even gift the movie to your friends. We have all sorts of cool things where you can. You have group discounts. If you go in with a bunch of people, you can you can get a discount. So there's lots of ways to enjoy the movie at thecoddlingmovie.com. Yeah, the, the coddlingmovie.com, and we're even thinking about if people are interested. Uh, if you're a student or a young person and you want to host a pizza party and show it to your friends, we'll we'll throw you like a hundred bucks or something like that. We're even looking into that because we want yeah. young people to to watch it and to share it because that's who we're trying to help. We're not just complaining about what's going on with the mental we health crisis. We do a lot of complaining <laughs> in the movie, but uh, more importantly, uh, thanks to the excellent work of Greg and John, uh, we, we want to show them the solutions and how to get out of it. That's the most important part of our effort with this film. Great. Uh, Courtney Balaker, Ted Balaker, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you, thanks Nick. Thanks for having us, Nick. Great to see you again.